Mike. You sound great. Good. Welcome into the Storycraft Cafe. I am Hank Garner, your host, and today I am super excited to have Grant Faulkner, who uh, you know is the magician uh, <laughs> behind the curtain of NaNoWriMo. And and uh, if uh, if you have been in the writing community for any amount of time, you are probably very familiar with NaNoWriMo. If you're not, you will be before the end of this conversation. Welcome to the show, Grant. Thank you, Hank. Yeah. Great um, to be here. Absolutely. Um, super excited to have you. Um, when uh, when Jacob uh, from Dabble uh, sent me a message and said, um, I think we could get Grant to come on the podcast. I was like, yes, we <laughs> definitely ought to have a conversation with Grant. Um, so as I was telling you off the air, uh, I have been a nano participant since 2013. Wow. Uh, that was the first year that I did it just realized that this is 10 years going in now and nano uh helped me write my first novel um that cool. i uh indie published a, a decade ago and it really has a very special place in my heart because uh as uh i'd had many conversations with my wife over the years and i had threatened to write a novel as i <laughs> <laughs> for years and i i don't I've been trying to remember how I discovered NaNoWriMo exactly. I think I was just Googling, you know, how do you write a novel? You know, what, what are the best? And, and I think I stumbled onto one of the pep talks. I okay. think is how I did it. And, and, you know, you, you follow this link and that link and bam, you know, you're in NaNoWriMo. Um, but uh, you know, I got 50,000 words that first wow. November and, which, you know, I had no idea I could do and you know, Nano helped me do that. So um, anyway, I say all that. I'm just kind of fanboying for a second while I, you no, know, it's a, well, well, it's always interesting to me how people find NaNoWriMo. Yeah. And oftentimes it is uh, like they don't know how they found it. <laughs> right, <laughs> and, right. And they do stumble upon it, clicking a few links. Um, the number one reason people um, we, we survey every year about how people yeah. came to NaNoWriMo and it's the number one reason is through a friend, a friend invited mm. them to join. And, and I'm really actually proud of that. Um, Absolutely. We don't have a big marketing budget, but when we've like marketed or put ads out there, or done cross promotional stuff, all that's great, but we're fundamentally a community. So I take a lot of pride in that kind of invitation from a friend uh, brings other people in because we're, you know, all about community, all about collaboration. So, right. Yeah. And it, it really is that community aspect, I believe, that helped me to to get the job done. Uh, you know, I had been a a writer for years. I had written columns for our local newspaper. I had blogged and, you know, but there was something about having this community that was focused on a goal yeah. that helped me to, to have, uh, you know, a goal in mind and to work toward that goal. And that is something that, that you just don't, you know, that lots of people have, you know, written solitary novels, not to discount that, but yeah, but there's something to be said for community and, and it, doing it together. It's really interesting. And, and I hear this a lot from people is that they are galvanized by just the feeling, just the pulse yeah. of, of feeling like the whole world is writing along with them. And, and sometimes they might be writing uh, in their in their bedroom, you know, with, without right. anyone uh, in close proximity, but it is that feeling that you're part of this larger movement mm -hmm. and people will feel accountable to that and also just galvanized and inspired by it. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. It really is. So, so Grant, um, this question, I love asking people, uh, what is your first memory of wanting <laughs> to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh boy. You know, with me, um, I, I don't know. I think it's so interesting because I do think about this from time to time is that yeah. I just can't remember a moment in my life where I didn't identify as a writer or think of myself as a writer. And of, of course, you know, I mean, going back to when I was like three years old, some of my first memories were me running down the steps uh, of our house, you know, with an idea for a, for a story and me wanting to eagerly tell my mom, you know, what that was going to <laughs> all be about. And that was before I even knew how to write letters or words, um, you know, but of course it wasn't like a clear line, there were a lot of, uh, you know, other kind of career options or, or 
or possibilities that I entertained along the way. But but writing was always there. It was never it was never not part of me. So yeah, yeah, it's always been. I always knew I would write something. Well, it's so funny because um, I, I've done over fifteen hundred uh, author interviews, and I could count on on my two hands uh, the number of writers who who said, you know, I never wanted to be a writer. And then one day I had an idea and I just wrote a book. Yeah. Um, the vast, vast majority of people say that they use language like, well, I was always a writer or right. I always had stories going on in, in, in my head. And, you know, and I used to think that there was this writer gene or, yeah. or something that some people are just born with. And what I've realized, and I've heard you talk about this before, um, is that I think most people, are writers or storytellers i, I kind of like to use that language sometimes because even if we don't write the story down there's something innate about humans that we're storytellers we communicate in in story and yeah. and and i think that that's a lot of us now uh, weirdly a small portion of those people will actually take that next step and and start to write down that story and then an even smaller portion of people will finish that goal and then you know and it, it gets narrower and narrower until you wind up at a bookstore one day um <laughs> you know um but uh you know and and i can't i i guess nanowrimo kind of um capitalizes on that that feeling that that people have stories to tell what kind of, yeah. what are what's kind of that that core value of nanowrimo when you think about the the human storytelling innateness yeah it's interesting that you put it that way because i personally have wondered do i have a writer gene does this just <laughs> does this exist i don't know right but i do think the larger point is is the more interesting one is is the way that stories work um in terms of like who we are as people and who we are as a, as a species really yeah. i mean i i actually don't think this is talked about quite enough like the fact that our brains are wired to tell stories, that every yes. single human being is a storyteller. And, and and it's not just like trivial kind of fantasy entertainment type of stories, although those are perfectly valid and good unto themselves. But, but yeah. we make meaning of the world through our stories. And we make meaning of ourselves and who we are and who we are with other people and who other people are. And we make meaning of the whole universe through stories. You know, we shape we shape our thought through stories. So I, I, I often at times don't wonder, I wonder why we don't make, make that kind of storytelling, the art of storytelling more kind of primary part of our educational curriculum and, yeah. and just our day-to-day -day lives. And you're right. That's what NaNoWriMo is there for is because unfortunately a lot of people diminish um, the importance of their own stories and uh, they don't recognize perhaps the role that storytelling uh, plays in their own lives and so our our primary mission is to help people believe that their stories matter, and 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 really we're the only. I mean we're we're not the only organization, but we're very unique in being very centered in this. Yes, and that that is when you talk about the community that's galvanizing you to finish your novel. That all comes from this belief that everyone has a story that matters, and that it's very important to tell that story. So yeah, so that's really what we're all about is is, is encouraging people and empowering people to 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 put their story in the world do you remember uh what your first story idea was that that became a a full finished you know novel or, or story oh my gosh um you know what's interesting for me is that i i i've always been a writer and i've always written yeah. in like journals and i've always written poems and short stories and you know, I majored in English in college and I got my MFA degree later in my 20s, but I didn't write my first completed novel until I was in my late 20s. Um, and so what I find interesting to me is that, you know, because Nano, because I grew up without NaNoWriMo, I was older right. than NaNoWriMo. And I'll talk to people, kids in our Young Writers program, and they'll be 16 or 17 and they'll have written six, seven, eight novels already. And sometimes they will have published wow. them. So, you know, I, I just think I'm, a, I'm in, you know, I, while I do that first novel, I remember what it was about. It was, but, but I didn't complete it until my, my late twenties. And it was, um, a sort of contemporary version of crime and punishment set in San Francisco in the, the early nineties and crime and punishment was actually the first big 
you know, serious literature book that I ever, literary book that I ever read. And I read it by accident. I didn't know who Fyodor Dostoevsky was or <laughs> what the, what Russian literature really was. I, I checked it out right. because I was assigned to do a paper on, on crime. <laughs> I guess my library card catalog skills weren't that good. But anyway, it was a, a, a wonderful thing because I took the novel home. I was 14 years old and I was riveted by it. And so it's always played large in my imagination. And I guess that's what led me to kind of think about how to, how to write a version of that. Um, well, that, that's, that had to be a, a very mind altering experience for a 14 year old. It was, I remember it. I mean, I'll just never forget <laughs> that reading experience. It was, um, I, I've reread the novel a couple times and it, and it does, it, it has, it lives up to that first reading experience, but for a 14 year old, especially it was, um, yeah, just so, uh, so I, I, I carry it with me in my cells. Wow. Um, how did NaNoWriMo get started? Um, I, it started back in the late 90s. Do, do I understand? I love that the right? origin story. Yeah. Chris Beatty. I didn't found it. A lot, a lot of times people say that I found it, founded it, but I did, didn't. So I, I don't like to um, be credited with it because Chris Beatty is um, such a wonderful person. And he, he says he founded it accidentally. And I think that that's true. Mm -hmm. It's something to keep in mind, like sometimes accidental things uh, turn out to be huge wonderful things and so yeah. he basically woke up and wanted to write a novel and he uh, was a passionate reader and he looked over at his bookshelves and took out some of the more slender volumes like catcher in the rye or the great gatsby and estimated that they were about fifty thousand words long and then did some very complicated math and realized oh you could do this in 30 days if you really set your mind to it and chris is a very social guy and so he invited about 20 of his friends to join him and they met in coffee shops uh, after after work, and uh, they they again they everything they did that first unofficial NaNoWriMo we do now. So they wrote together, and if somebody didn't show up, uh, they would call and and say, "Hey, you still writing your novel? Want to join us tomorrow?" So there was a kind of built-in accountability system. They made writing fun. They did a lot of different writing games, like they would challenge each other who could write. 500 words first and whoever wrote the 500 words might get a latte and then they do another game that i think is the most efficient way to to write words in the world is they would um after they had a, a lot of caffeine they would um <laughs> you, you couldn't go to the bathroom until you'd written 500 words or a thousand words so you know it really helps you get the pen on the page and, and really develop your story so so there yeah really so something we, to gamifying uh writing something weird about our brains really loves that exactly and and uh, the one uh the most important piece of technology on our uh, sophisticated website is our word count tracking tool oh, yeah. and i've read psychological studies per your comment about gamification um you know because writers also like rewards you know if you write sure. ten thousand words you might want to give yourself i don't know whatever a massage, nice bottle of wine, nice meal, something like that to motivate you. But they say, I've read that the, a bigger motivation is just to watch your bar graph go up. And 100%. Yeah. And so that implicit, I think that's an implicit reward is is kind of more important than the explicit rewards. And there's nothing better than than earning one of those badges and posting it on Facebook or Twitter and like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So Chris, um, he, he, you know, when I mentioned that the community that he started is still with us now, we have a thousand volunteers around the world who organize wow. writing gatherings, much like Chris did. We're really, I mean, we're a tiny nonprofit where we really rely on, on the goodwill of others and the volunteers. Sure. Um, but yeah, b between gamification and making writing whimsical and fun and not taking it too serious and writing with friends, and community that's all you know kind of kind of who we are um core part of our organizational identity um how did you uh how did you discover NaNoWriMo yeah I was writing I was working for the National Writing Project which, which is an organization focused on helping teachers teach writing better and I was really just looking to deepen my nonprofit management and leadership and I Chris was only an acquaintance and I reached out to him kind of randomly and just asked him if he knew of any uh, board positions in, in um, arts organizations in the Bay Area. And he said, why don't we have lunch and talk and maybe you could join NaNoWriMo. And I had no, I just thought, didn't think that was possible at all. But um, we talked and I interviewed with the board and they invited me to be on the board. So I was on the board 
for almost a year um, before Chris stepped down. When I joined the board, though, Chris's first words were to me, he was like, by the way, I'm going to step down and you should apply for my job. So Chris, Chris basically recruited me for it. Um, what year was so, this? Uh, I started in 2012. So that would have been 2011 okay. when I was on the board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so kind of accidentally, I found my way to NaNoWriMo <laughs> accidentally in my way. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Um, how many participants uh, this this past year, um, well, not quite six months ago, uh, was NaNoWriMo? Mm -hmm. Uh, how, how many participants did you have this past year? Do you... Yeah, we, 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 we count participants differently. We used to focus just on the event itself, but now we, okay. the website is structured for year-round writing. So it's kind of like right. Fitbit for writers. You can go there and set in any uh, time parameters for a deadline and a goal. So we had about 500,000 people total um, wow. write with us last year. And then generally around 300,000 people participate in NaNoWriMo. And about a hundred thousand people participate, or kids and kids and teens participate in our young writers program. Wow, that yeah. is amazing! Um, your young writers program. What is what's the idea there to to get people accustomed to to carrying this forward for the rest of their lives? Do you think <laughs> in terms like that? Like, you know, if we can get people hooked early on, then then. That's right. We're like the writing drug dealer in the neighborhood. We're like, kid, you got a story yeah. to tell. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But um, I think uh, it's more, you know, early on. And again, this was before my time. Uh, teachers were teaching NaNoWriMo. T teachers who they were, were first participants and writers. And then they, they started teaching it. And they basically asked us then to develop a program for them. And so we developed a curriculum aligned to the common core. Uh, we have uh, workbooks for all grade levels. Um, and we have a whole big website with a writing platform and virtual classrooms and, and a lot of uh, cool things. Um, so, so the premise being that, that I mean, this is something I, I think writing is oftentimes, unfortunately, a lot of people are intimidated by writing. Um, they're fearful of writing. They have uh, bad experiences with writing instruction growing up. And I think the best way to teach anything is through joy and fun. Absolutely. And so uh, like that's basically our, our place in the curriculum is that kids can write a novel. Kids rarely get to write what they want to write about. Yeah. They get to choose their topic. They get to explore it. They don't have to think about what's wrong or right about it. And all of this makes them more attuned and interested in language and actually more interested in grammar because they care about their story. They want to write it well. And so NaNoWriMo is a, is, is a great gateway to that, um, to ac actually enjoying writing and enjoying reading more. And so that's what we hear from, from teachers and parents and kids themselves. So I'm really proud of that program. I love it. I know that NaNoWriMo has expanded to uh, right now we're in the middle of camp uh, NaNoWriMo in April and August. Is it uh, uh, April and July? Yeah, April and July. So, sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, youth programs and things that you've been talking about. But if if we were to distill it down, it NaNoWriMo was originally National Novel Writing Month, uh, yeah. which is November. Um my birthday is in the middle of November, and then <laughs> as the calendar falls, most 90% of the time, Thanksgiving is the very next week from my birthday. And so in the middle of NaNoWriMo, when I'm trying to write a novel, I've got my birthday, and I've got Thanksgiving, and it's a tough month, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, it to is. stay focused. Um, but invariably, almost in spite of these, you know, granted celebratory events that happen during the month, you know, you can get sidetracked very easily, but invariably um, almost in spite of those things, I, I find ways to work around it. Um, what was the original idea to have November uh, <laughs> as NaNoWriMo? I'm not sure how calculated it was, but I've heard Chris Beatty said, if you can write a novel in November, you can write a novel in any month. <laughs> Um, right. and, and I do think there's no real perfect month to write a novel. Yeah. And I do think that that's a good lesson because to be a writer, 
you know, there's always going to be something you're going to have to navigate, whether it's your birthday, whether it's a holiday, whether it's an illness, whether it's a work, you know, crisis of right. some sort or parental duties. So I think, it, I mean, I always view NaNoWriMo as a one part time management exercise. And so, that, you know, because you have to figure out how can I open up, like for me, it takes me at least two hours to write 1700 words. So I have to ask myself before November, how can I make the time to have two hours in the day? And I have to go in on time hunt usually and think about what I can give up to make that happen. And I think that's what writers have to do in general in life um, is, you know, you might not be writing 50,000 words in a month, but you might be writing uh, 500 words a day. Um, and how are you going to open up that hour or so to write every day? Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, I've heard um, people talk about, you know, um, going through the motions of, freeing up time um and a, a lot of times uh something fills in that time for you um and then at the end of the month you're like well i didn't write a novel again this month no. um but what was the the community aspect did it did it come from that original um idea of them meeting in a coffee shop and challenging one another and and you know from once that month was over what was the thought process in um, kind of building this out so that you could keep that community alive and we could offer this to other people and other people could start to like it, it, it almost uh, has been a viral um, growth yeah. that's happened. Yeah. And a lot of it is viral. You know, um, I think um, I, I wasn't there in the early days, so I don't know how consciously Chris constructed it, but yeah, you know, we do have, I mean, part of it is, I think, um, making writing fun and making it whimsical and not taking yourself too seriously. And I think that that writing in groups, when you have that attitude, it really helps. You know, and this isn't to say that your the quality of your prose is diminished as a result. Actually, I think it's heightened because you're not getting so worried about the quality of it or the your your. I mean, part of NaNoWriMo's um, philosophy is to get over your perfectionism, to get mm -hmm. over your perfectionist tendencies so you can get the words on the page and finish that first draft of your novel. So I think, you know, just that, that community spirit that Chris uh, started with, um, it was just like a lot of our ethos. Um, it's just passed along. We don't, we don't script anybody, but if you go into our forums or if you read comments on our, you know, Facebook page or Twitter or Instagram, generally you'll see people um, very generously encouraging other people. And I'm always like so touched by how it's like we have trained them to be media spokespeople, except that we haven't, you know, they're just out there spreading the goodwill. And so I think it's really interesting in a community when you have a community ethos, how it spreads, you know, virally uh, like that. And that's kind of how our community operates. You, you touched on something that, that I was going to ask you um, next, the, the idea that, um, you can't write a, a novel in one month. It's not going to be any good. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard that kind of feedback because I've heard it from people um, before. And it's like, if you have that mindset, you're completely missing the point for right. one. I mean, we're talking about a first draft, right? You, you shouldn't take, you know, you shouldn't December 1st self publish what you wrote in November. Um, that That's not the point. Um, right. You know, so how do you respond to this feedback from people that sort of dismiss it out of hand because nothing serious can come from a 30 day challenge? <laughs> yeah, know? it's funny how some people get very they, they act like we're creating some grave offense to the world <laughs> right. um, when we're just uh, encouraging people to write their story. And um, well, one, I would say, like you said, nobody's rough draft is any good. And that includes uh, some of our most celebrated and wonderful novelists. Uh, a rough draft by nature is an exploratory draft um, right. called a rough draft for a reason. Um, and, you know, we at NaNoWriMo also believe in rewriting and revision. Uh, but also, I think uh, by writing a rough draft with a more, um, you know, kind of free minded spirit and, and, and opening yourself up and getting over your perfectionist tendencies, I think, you know, it's interesting how. Sometimes we distrust that quantity of writing can lead to quality of writing. Right. Uh, yet we do trust it in terms of, you know, like Thomas Edison, it took him 10,000 experiments to, to finally 
come come up with the light bulb. Yeah. I think that that's an interesting metaphor for writing too. It's like you're you're trying different approaches, you're experimenting, you're playing. I mean, that's why I don't even call the fir- I don't even call it the first draft. I call it the discovery draft, and I think that that's what that's where I'm comfortable writing my first draft is really just discovering it, discovering the story, and exploring it. So, yeah, so I think that all in the end does lead to quality, though. That's my yeah. argument is that we're not we, we don't we while we might be producing 300,000 crappy rough drafts in November, I think afterwards, a lot of those become really good uh, drafts when people really pursue them. And um, also, I think there's something to be said for just the uh, working out your writing muscles, yeah. uh, especially if you're a beginning writer, is that, you know, the, I, I I, you know, there's that myth out there that to be a master in anything, you have to practice for 10,000 hours. Uh, I don't think that that's literally true, but I do think it's figuratively true. And so a lot of writers, they build their writing chops, their writing discipline through doing uh, NaNoWriMo. Yeah. When, when I first started, um, I had the idea that um, you start November 1st and you write quickly so that you don't have much time to think about it. And you just kind of get in touch with your subconscious mind and the story kind of Mm -hmm. flows out. And, and that's true um, for, for some people's process Um, that may be true for, for everyone as an exercise to just do something different. But um, somewhere along the way, I started noticing this prep tober, um, mm-hmm. idea and taking October to plan out what you would write and to get your mind around maybe the structure of your story and lay a roadmap of, of sorts. And I know that some people are, are very, um, uh, determined in getting their story planned out beforehand. And some people, you know, just like to fly, you know, by the seat of their pants in, in November and, and, you know, that does something for them. Um, I am a uh, I am a pantser evolving to a planner. Um, so I, I'm somewhere in the middle there, which I think a lot of people are. But um, when when did this this idea come about to uh, to give people time and space to to sort of plan out their story and to come into November maybe a little more intentionally? Yeah, I think. Um, well, one, we like to we're not prescriptive at NaNoWriMo we like to support I mean part of part of the nano the exercise of NaNoWriMo is finding your own creative process yeah so when you said you're a planter a pantser evolving towards being a planner um that you know that that's part of that evolution part of that experimentation is you find out what works for you and so you know we've just gradually uh grown what we call our nano prep season um, and grown our resources because some people do like to plan and that helps them succeed during NaNoWriMo. Uh, but it's not for everybody. So if you want to pants, uh, that's fine. And plenty of people show up uh, day one and sometimes they don't even know what their story is going to be. They just start and they have fun writing it. So, you know, I, I really like to think that we cover the the whole spectrum of, of writing approaches. And I have heard of people writing super meticulous outlines like single space 20 page outlines and you know and that's great you know it work if it works for them that's great uh but i wouldn't want to pressure anybody into thinking they have to have an outline in order to write a good novel because there's a rich rich history out there of people who sure who pants yeah yeah what do you recommend uh if someone uh tackles NaNoWriMo for the first time and they go through the whole of November uh, and they they get their 50,000 words down and then December 1st rolls around. W- what do you encourage people to do then and, and moving forward? Yeah, I suppose it depends if they've actually finished the novel, you know, writing 50,000 words. Uh, sometimes you need to write another 20 or 30,000 words to, yeah. to truly finish it. So that's one thing. Um, but, you know, generally, uh, I think it's good to take a little breather, um, especially if you're going to jump, you know, if, if revision is your next stage, I think. Um, and the reason I say to take a breather is partly just to, to regroup and re-energize yourself, but also to by taking a breather, uh, you can you gain objectivity. So, True. you know, that's when I revise, I take at least a month off and I'll do things like print the novel out, 
so that I can read it, not on my screen, but in a, something that resembles a book form. And I have different techniques for what I read for first and what I read for second and make notes in the margin and usually try to go out of my house, actually, a, a writing retreat if I can manage it, but at least uh, to a cafe. But yeah, so I think, I, you know, there, again, there's a whole, everybody has their own revision techniques. But um, but for me, I think it's like, you, I know that I'm not going to clean up everything in that first revision. So I'm still working hard also to find the story. I'm not just mm -hmm. cleaning up grammar. Uh, I did an interesting interview with uh, Peter Ho Davies um, on our Right Minded podcast. That's the Nanorama podcast, and and Peter had just written a book, The Art of Revision, and I found it very interesting because he didn't draw a clear line between drafting and revision. He didn't say that like drafting is one thing and revision is the other thing. Another thing, he said that it was like you're constantly envisioning and re envisioning your novel, so it's kind of constantly expanding and contracting and that you're really just working to deepen that story and to tell it better. And that's the way I view it too, is that, you know, again, like that first draft is a discovery draft, but that discovery draft doesn't go away. You keep, right. you keep deepening the discovery through revision. So that's, that's, I, I, I think sometimes people think that once you've finished that first draft that you just clean up some typos and and do some copy editing and it's done but it's more about looking at the big picture of a novel like what what is working or not working structurally what characterization do you need to deepen what characters are superfluous can you cut you know there's just so many big questions yeah. um, but i love uh revision actually that's my favorite place to be Re revision is where um is where the the story becomes the story almost uh -huh. it's where you've got this collection of ideas but you see a path through yeah and, and to me that's where that's where the story really comes alive is is in the revision yeah you need that drafting to get there but but that's for me a big part of the joy of writing is that deepening of the story and right. and um just finding more meaning and really you know, all, all the deep thought that goes into that. Right. Yeah. Along with the refinement of language too. It is, it is, it is nice to pause and write a little more slowly and to really think about, you know, the mood, the mood right. of your words, the rhythm of your words. Right. Uh, a few days ago we started uh, into April and that's the first month of camp NaNoWriMo. Um, what's the, what's the deal with with camp nanorimo where where did it come from and what's the purpose of this month and and july yeah camp nanorimo came about about 10 years ago um or 11 years ago actually um and its purpose was for those people who couldn't do nanorimo in november you know we'd hear a lot about pe people who couldn't do it in november so it was an alternative for them but then we expanded that alternative and we made it so that you wouldn't have to write 50,000 words in a month that you could set your own uh, word count goal and you could write it in any genre too. So it's not novel focused. So if you want to write a, you know, 10 short stories, you can do that. If you want to write an epic poem, you can do that. Um, and so, so it's more just wide open and casual essentially. And that was before we had our site constructed so that you could enter um, a goal and a deadline you know, throughout the year, do independent projects, as we call them. So now you can do it all. You can do NaNoWriMo in November. You can do independent projects throughout the year, and you can do camp in April and July. The other thing we have within that, too, is, is the ability to, to focus on a revision in, in April and July. Gotcha. What is, uh, what's life like uh, outside November for the NaNoWriMo team? Uh, is, is, is your whole world, your whole year, focus toward november or are there other things that are you know uh kind of driving the the nanowrimo narrative throughout the year yeah both um we gear up for nanowrimo uh throughout the year but we also do these other uh, smaller events like we do i wrote a novel now what which is about revision and publishing and we focus on that in january and february and then we focus on camp in april and july and then we're just doing yeah a lot of hustle um you know, kind of constantly trying to keep people engaged and meet, meet writers where they are to help them. Uh, you said earlier that, uh, that NaNoWriMo is funded, um, you know, solely from the generosity of others. If, if people 
believe in what you do and are thankful that NaNoWriMo exists, uh, what can they do to, to, to help out, to join in the cause and to, you know, to support what they love? Yeah, we are a nonprofit. So thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, we have a, a donate button on our website. And um, I would recommend that if people can donate anything. You know, our average donation is is $26. So we run on small dollar donations. We don't have any many true big benefactors. We don't we don't have a, a Jeff Bezos or a Bill Gates funding us. Um, so yeah, most of our, I think about 60 to 70% of our revenue comes from the writers who take part in our programs wow. and, and feel good about it. And they donate 25 bucks or so or buy a mug or a t-shirt. So that's really, that's what makes it happen. I mean, that's why, again, like I stress that we are a community, um, not only a community of writers, but we, we are, we run on community support. Love it. Love it. Um, so Grant, what what's going on with with your writing these days? Because <laughs> you started as a writer, and um, is is there anything uh, big that you're working on or a, a passion project? Yeah, I actually just published a book called The Art of Brevity. Kind of my other side of the, as a writer is a, in the flash fiction community. I run a, a literary journal called One Hundred Word Story, and I've been doing that since 2011. And the gist of it is, is that we publish stories that have to be exactly 100 words, not 99, not 101, 100 words. And so um, it's, it's, I published a collection of my own 100 word stories called Fissures. And I just wrote this book, The Art of Brevity, which is uh, essentially a meditation or a reflection on the aesthetic of, of brevity. So I'm really excited about that. And I've been going around and talking about it on podcasts like this. I, I love that idea because uh, novelists, um, you know, are are, are usually um, not succinct people because we've got a hundred thousand <laughs> words to play with, you know, right? Like, you know, um, but distilling down what you want to say to exactly one hundred words, um, th- that's that's a uh, a wild thing to think about, um, but I can it's also kind of tantalizing to think about, you know, to, to really get down to exactly what you want to say it, it with no fluff and no superfluous, you know, additions. Uh, w- what has that meditation as you uh, called it, w- what has that done for your writing life kind of making you get down to the, to the meat of the issue? It's really interesting because I think writing, especially hundred word stories, it's it's as much an exercise in editing as it is in, yeah. in writing, you know. So you're you're constantly kind of tinkering with your prose, and and I, I think of it as like a Rubik's cube. You're 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 you know you might have ninety three words in your story, so to add another seven words, well, you usually end up adding like twelve words, and then you've got to subtract some words. So you got to like go back, and then you might subtract eight or nine. You know what I mean? You're going back and forth. Yeah. And this sounds like it's all kind of trivial, but by going back and forth, what you're doing is you're paying so much more intense uh, attention to your prose, you know, to every word in the sentence and the way that every sentence operates. And sometimes the, the story will kind of evolve and morph as, as you're doing that. And so it's a really interesting exercise for me in, in terms of also about how constraints bring, bring out a different type of creativity. So like you said, I mean, I, I think sometimes a novel is like a Southwestern city. You, you don't have to worry too much about development constraints. You can just keep expanding and expanding right. and expanding and build more and more freeways. Uh, but you can't do that with, with flash fiction. You've got some built-in constraints. So you have to be really, really thoughtful about everything that you do. Uh, so it's just a different experience. Um, Nicholas Sparks wrote a book. It was a, a, a memoir-ish. Uh, some, it, I can't remember the name. It was something... It, it, he took a trip with his brother. They they went on a trip around the world, and it, he was it was kind of part travel log, but then mixed in there, he was telling the story of his writing career. Um, three weeks with my brother, it, uh-huh. it, it, it may not have that right. Anyway, uh, he was talking about his first book that he wrote, the Notebook, and there was a scene in there where um, Noah, I think it was the the character's name, who who got shipped off to war and he tells this whole story of how he was in a battle and he had a book of poetry that he carried in his shirt pocket. And one time uh, in the battle, he got shot, but the, 
the bullet lodged in the book and it saved his life. Hmm. And, and he had written several pages of description around this. And then he was talking about the editing process and he kept whittling it down and whittling it down until he finally came. Uh, this is a paraphrase. He said, I carried this book of poetry with me and one day it saved my life. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, you know, you take four pages of description and, and bring it down to this one sentence. And that one sentence says everything. Yeah. Um, so I love that idea of, of, you know, getting down to the, to the heart of the matter. That's, mm -hmm. um, that's something I'm going to try. I'm, I'm going to take some story ideas and see if I can get them down to a hundred words. It, it, it's interesting how it affects your longer work. Like you said, um, it, um, you know, I mean, I mean, not, I, I like big, messy novels, so I'm not speaking against them at all. Like sure. crime, and, crime and Punishment was one of my entrees into the big, messy novel that I mentioned right. earlier. So there's a there's a place for that. Um, at the same time, it's interesting to me about how um, writing the shorter stuff has attuned me to to exactly that concision and um, efficiency of prose and, and and writing for the essence. So it's it's a lot of those things are more um, things I think that one learns from poetry. Yeah. And what's the name of that book? The, your new book? My new book is called The Art of Brevity. Yeah. The Art of Brevity. Yeah. Right. We'll, we'll I'll uh, add a link to that in the show notes to oh, cool. uh, make it easy for folks to find. Um, Grant, this has been so much fun chatting. Um, I'm a huge fan of everything that you do. Um, if if folks are, are, you know, just dropped in from Mars or whatever and never heard of NaNoWriMo, <laughs> how do you get started? And And, you know, where do I plug into this great community? Yeah, go to nanorimo.org, N-A-N-O-W-R-I-M-O.org. And uh, everything we do is free because we want it to provide, we don't want any there to be any barriers between people and their stories. We want total access. So go to the website and sign up. And it's kind of like signing up for a social media site. You'll, you'll put in um, like your novel title, your novel genre. You can write an excerpt for your novel if you want, things like that. And so, and then you'll be on our mailing list and we'll, we'll email you, um, and tell you when we have writing events going. And, um, but we also just email, um, things like pep talks from authors and, uh, other writing resources as well. So I do that. And, and part of the, part of the, the website also is to like, um, if you're living in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, you'll want to sign up for the Baltimore, Maryland region so that you can get um, emails and know of writing gatherings in your local community, too. So we call that homing a region. So there's a whole region part of the website where you can you can um, identify where you are in the world. Yeah. I love it. Um, we'll we'll link that up in the show notes uh, as well. Uh, Grant, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Absolutely. Thank you for the wonderful conversation, Hank. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>